Good morning, Bridge, and thank you for tuning in with us. We are on our second installment of our series on powerful prayers. And today uh, we are going to concentrate on this idea of pleading as it relates to prayer. So please pray with me. Father, in the name of Jesus, as we are talking about pleading, oh God, I plead with you, I beg of you today that you would forgive us all of our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness, my own sin, oh God, and that of our of, of the people, oh God, that you would be with us, that you would not only cleanse us, but that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit and that you would give us something today to digest that will become a part of us forever, that we may grow in stature and knowledge of you and love of you. Uh, I ask, oh God, that you would remove me out of the scene so that uh, people may be able to hear you, that I may be able to hear you. Hide me behind the shadow of the cross. It's my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so this idea of pleading. Now, I, I, I looked up uh, pleading in the dictionary, and it gave me the definition of, of making an emotional or earnest appeal to someone. So the making of, a, of an emotional, earnest appeal to someone is what's called pleading. So pleading is not... It's not just asking, it's not just wanting something, but it is to, it is to supplicate, it is to implore, it is to, it is to, it is to beg, basically. So therefore, it is, it, it, because it, it, it's, it's begging, it's employing, in, 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 it's supplicating, it is completely devoid of pride, because any hint of pride will, prevent you from begging. You will not reduce yourself to beg or plead your case with nobody, for nobody, in front of anybody, if you are filled with pride. In 1966, The Temptations released a song called, I Ain't Too Proud to Beg. And in 1974, the Rolling Stones uh, 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 redid the song as well. And then in 1988, Rick Astley also did the song. And I don't know if you remember, it's something like, I know you want to leave me, but I refuse. Let me just go ahead and recite it. But I refuse to let you go. If I have to beg and plead for your sympathy, I don't mind because you mean that much to me. Ain't too proud to beg and you know it. Sweet darling, please don't leave me, girl. Don't you go. Ain't too proud to beg, to plead, baby, baby. Don't leave me, girl. Don't you go. And I, I remember the song. It was a fun song. I love the song. And let's be honest. If you are a man and you've been married for any length of time, you're very familiar with begging for one reason or another. So you should understand what begging means and how devoid of, of, of pride it would requ it, it, it's required. As a matter of fact, Keith Sweat, I don't know if you remember, singer, songwriter, producer, Keith Sweat, he begged his way all the way to the top of the R&B charts in the 80s and the 90s. And all of his hit songs were, baby, please, please, baby, after another. One begging after another, one pleading after another. And not to say that women don't plead too. TLC released in 1992 a, 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 a song by the same title, I ain't, ain't Too Proud to Beg, a little raunchy for my taste, but it is the same sentiment. The sentiment is that it is impossible to plead while holding on to pride. And if you are proud, you will not plead. That is the reason why a, even in those songs, they say not too proud to beg because to beg requires a release of pride. This is a biblical concept that's so real and so down to earth that even the world understands it. You cannot have pride, um, plead, at the same time, the world 
knows that if you want, need something from someone else, there is a chance that you might get it if you can humble yourself enough to plead or even to beg. The danger is that if you are ignored or ridiculed for begging, for pleading, then you feel humiliated. And for this reason, people often uh, they, they choose not to chance it because I don't want you to hurt my feelings if I plead with you, if I beg with you, if I get down on my knees and then you humiliate me. But when it comes to God, there's no choice in the matter. It is the only way to successfully approach the throne of God. Peter quotes the Proverbs when he says in 1 Peter uh, 5, 5, the, the, the second half of it, he says that God opposes the proud, but he shows favor to the humble. And unlike the world who might mock you for your humility, God will never turn you away. Look at Psalms 51, 17, where he says, where, where David says, my sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart you, God, will not despise. Being able to swallow your pride and fall be, before an all-loving and also all-just all God and plead with him is the only way that your prayers can be effective. The apostle admonishes in Philippians 4, 6, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Here is the concept of pleading by this apostle. God has always had compassion on those who present themselves without pride, pleading. It is coming to God with the understanding that whatever you want, whatever you need, is completely undeserving for God to grant it to you. That's the whole point of the whole pleading, is your, your understanding, whatever it is, whatever it is that you're going to ask for, is with the understanding that you do not deserve it. It is an attitude, a heart posturing, if you will, that reaches the heart of God. And what does that look like? Let's take a look. Look at Nehemiah, the first, uh, well, the first chapter. We're going to read the entire chapter. I want you to kind of take a look at this. Verse one, the words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah, in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hanani, one of my brothers came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. You see, he was a, a, a still part of that group that, that, that was exiled into, into Persia, but there were still a remnant in, in Jerusalem, and, and, and Nehemiah was inquiring about them. They said to me, verse three, they said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and distress. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burnt with fire, which means that they were exposed to the elements. They were exposed to attacks from enemies. They were exposed to, to wild animals. They were exposed to, to just about everything. So they were extremely defense less because of these, this situation with the, with the walls. Verse four, when I heard these things, I sat down and I wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before God of heaven. Then I said, this is what pleading looks like. Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keeps and keep his commandments. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself, 
and my father's family have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly towards you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws you gave your servant Moses. Remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses, saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you around among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commandments, then if you are, if your exile people are at the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. They are your servants and your people whom you redeem by your great strength and your mighty hand. Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. I was cupbearer to the king. So there was a longing here, a pressure within Nehemiah's heart. He wanted to do something about the problems that Jerusalem and Israel was facing. But he, uh, he understood that in order for him to be able to do something, he would need the king's permission and the king's provision. But he also understood that the king's disposition was in the hand of God. He also understood that all that he and his fellow Israelites were suffering was due to, to their own disobedience. God warned them and told them specifically that the consequences of them being unfaithful would be that they would be scattered among the nations, that they would live in exile. You see, mercy was undeserved. Grace was undeserved. But this is where the putting away of pride comes in. You have to understand something very, very clear. If you deserve mercy, then whatever it is, it is no longer mercy. If you deserve it, then it is not mercy. If you deserve grace, then whatever it is, it is no longer grace. The only way we can call whatever we get from the hand of God grace or mercy is because it is undeserved. That is the reason why it is grace. That is the reason why it is mercy. And Nehemiah approached the throne of God with the understanding that whatever he was going to ask would require the grace, would require the mercy of God because it was undeserved. What they deserved was what they were getting right now. So he prayed earnestly. He pleaded with God. Four months later, Nehemiah's opportunity to see what would happen to his prayer came to fruition. Look at the second chapter, beginning with verse one. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was brought for him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. I had not been sad in his presence before. So the king asked me, why does your face look so sad when you are not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. Even the fact that the king was able to recognize this in one of his servants, one of many, is the hand of God working. I was very much afraid, says Nehemiah, but I said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire. The king said to me, what is it you want? Here it is, the, here is the open door. And God caused this, opened the door for him because of how Nehemiah approached him. 
The king said to me, what is it that you want? Then I prayed to the God of heaven. That had to be a really quick prayer. And I answered the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my ancestors are buried so that I can rebuild it. Then the king, with the queen sitting beside him, asked me, how long will your journey take? And when will you get back? It pleased the king to send me, so I set a time. I also said to him, if it pleases the king, may I have letters to the governors of Trans-Euphrates so that they will provide me safe conduct until I arrive in Judah? And may I have a letter to Asa, keeper of the royal park, so he will give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel by the temple and for the city wall and for the residence I will occupy? And because the gracious hand of my God was on me. The king granted my request. So I went to the governors of Trans-Euphrates and gave them the king's letters. The king also sent an army officers and cavalry with me. I'm telling you, Bridge, that it is okay to plead with God. I remember even times as a child when I was able to divert judgment and punishment from my parents by humbly pleading with them and their hearts would be moved with compassion. Even as a teenager, I also did this. That is until they learned that I learned how to manipulate them with crocodile tears and then the joke was on me because they would not be manipulated. But that's it's the same thing with God. It has to be real. In order to experience powerful prayers, you have to come to God correctly. And pleading is a necessary ing ingredient because it requires humility. Watch this. Luke 18. This is what happened with Jesus. Read this with me. Verse 9 to some who were confident in their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else. Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. You must come to God correctly when you do. And I'm going to make a very bold statement here when I say the following, that God always answers prayers. Now, notice what I did not say. I did not say that God always gives you what you ask for. What I did say is that God always answers prayers. Let me tell you something. Even the prayer that Nehemiah prayed, God could have very well had said no. And we are going to examine that next week when we talk about prevailing in prayer, because you have to understand what it means to, to, to have a successful prayer life. To be successful in your prayer does not mean that God gives you everything you want. And we will discuss this next week. But for now, bear in mind that pleading your case requires humility. Enter into the loving arms of God, yes, with the confidence that he is your father. But please also understand that he owes you 
nothing. So you cannot approach him as if he, there is that debt that he has to pay you. Many of our of our children, our teenagers, and, and, and we live in such, a, in such a society where they feel entitled and they tend to approach you as if you, you, you owe them something. And I'm gonna tell you something. Sometimes we as parents fall into that trap. And the reason why we fall into it because we reasoned that they did not ask to be born. We were the ones who kind of brought them into this world. And so because of that, then somehow we owe them. But guess what? We didn't ask for God to make us either. Yet you wouldn't dream of demanding anything from God as if he was your genie and, you know, grant me my three wishes because I rubbed the, the lamp. Same situation. You have got, you have to come correct. You have no idea how many times I blooded out stuff to my mother. My mother would go like, oh, let's try that again. Go ahead and ask again. And the whole point of this was not that I was not allowed to ask, but how I asked was important. God is still God and he is still holy. And we are still human beings who have been redeemed, not because of any goodness of our own. So if anybody owes anything to anybody, we owe God and not the way around. So I leave you with these words. Plead your case with God and he will grant you the desires of your heart. And I will explain that better next week. God bless you.